Bibles to the book of Haggai. Book of Haggai. You might be wondering where that's at. That's in your uh, uh, your minor prophets. Uh, if you find the book of Matthew, you've gone too far, but it is just two books prior to that. I get in trouble for not putting that down all the way. The book of Haggai, and I want you to look at uh, chapter two. And if you'll stand this evening, we'll read God's Word together. Haggai chapter 2, if you're able to, in an honor to the Word of God, would you please stand? Haggai chapter 2, and I want us to read verses 1 through 3. Verses 1 through 3, Haggai chapter 2 says, In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the Word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. Let's pray. Father, we love you, Lord. I thank you once again tonight for your word, and Lord, I just pray that you use it in the way that you do. We know, Father, that it's sharper than any two-edged sword, and it pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Father, I pray that you'd use it in such manner tonight that you'd help those who have been faithful tonight, those who are in many ways the remnant of this church, the ones who have held on strong, the ones who have continued in the faith, the ones who have been steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, Father. Help us tonight as your remnant, in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Verse 3, 
as we just read, I'll go ahead and read it to you again. It says, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? In other words, he was comparing the condition of the house of Israel to its first glory. And there were people there, I'll give you a little bit of the history and a little bit of the background, there were people there who had seen that. They had seen the first glory of the temple that was there. Not everyone had died and passed away. There were still some people there who had seen it. For us, this could be read or understood as, who among you saw FHIBC in her first glory? And so I'll compare that in a little bit tonight. And then he asked, how do you see it now? Isn't it nothing now in comparison to what it used to be? And that's kind of what's being said here. And I realize we have to sort of uh, uh, look at types in the Bible. And, and certainly we can look at the temple versus the church of God. We can look at uh, the house of Israel versus uh, the church of God, which is the pillar and the ground of the truth. But we're going to make those comparisons. And we're going to find that even our Lord Jesus Christ, he made those comparisons uh, with the church of God and the temple of God. And so... I just ask that you stay attentive tonight. These last prophets in our Bible, being Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, uh, are not prophets to the northern and southern kingdoms as we find in the prophets' writings prior to this book. Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi are prophets to the returning remnant of Jews from Babylon back to their home country. And so that's a way that you can sort of section off your minor prophets there. These last three books deal with the returning remnant who are returning back to their hometown after, after uh, King Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed their land. In 586 B.C., Jerusalem was destroyed by the in- evil king Nebuchadnezzar. And for 70 years it lie waste as a barren wasteland. In our Borough Bible Club, uh, we're, we've, we're going through a series right now called Dare to be a Daniel. And Daniel, during that destruction, was actually taken with his, four fr- with his three friends, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they were taken away from Babylon, or from, Jer- from Judah and Jerusalem as, as King Nebuchadnezzar came in in 586 B.C. and destroyed their homeland and took them to a faraway land that was foreign to them. And even through all of that, even after being kidnapped and taken away from his family, he was still faithful to God. And Daniel is a wonderful example for us to follow. But that's sort of where we find ourselves. Now we're at the end of that. Now we're at the end of that. Jerusalem was destroyed by the evil king Nebuchadnezzar, and for 70 years it lay waste as a barren wasteland. Sometime around 520 B.C., Haggai, thank God, the prophet, began his ministry. His ministry was very short, just enough to get the, the people back to God, and then Zechariah, or Zechariah and Malachi carried on what he had started. Their mission was to restore the worship of the true and living God by rebuilding the temple Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed. Here we find a man whom God raised up at a specific time for a specific mission. He was, and many would say, was God's man at the time. He was the man who was called to help them rebuild the temple and to reestablish the worship of the true and living God. That's who Haggai the prophet was. From humanity's beginning, God has desired to live among and commune with his people. In the Garden of Eden, God walked and talked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. I'm sure you all can remember that in reading your Bible. When he made his covenant with Israel, the Lord promised, And I will set my tabernacle among you, and I will walk among you, and will be your God, and you shall be my people. That's what God said. As the Israelites wandered in the desert, God wanted to inhabit a place with his people. At that time, the people lived in portable tents. So the presence of God dwelled in the tent of the congregation or the tabernacle of the congregation, as the Bible tells us in Exodus. His presence was the guiding force that told the people when to stay put, uh, when to stay put, and when to pull up stakes and continue on their journey. Later, after the Hebrew people entered the promised land and lived in fixed dwellings, God affixed his name to a place, sanctifying Solomon's temple as the Lord's holy dwelling place, found in 1 Kings chapter 8. In the New Testament, we find that God's presence was manifest in a new way. Jesus Christ became the new earthly temple of God, and those who believed on Him for eternal life became temples, plural. John 2, 21. In other words, God Himself came to dwell not among, but inside His people. This is a wonderful truth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 
And in verses 16 through 17, it says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? Talking to the Christians there at, 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 at Corinth. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. It is important to remember that though we are temples of God individually, our temple is not complete, or our temple lies in ruin if we are not assembled together with other believers. And by the way, that's biblical. We are not islands unto ourselves, and it's found in Ephesians chapter 2 and other places of the Bible. Paul addresses the church body at Ephesus as a spiritual temple, the church body. Listen to this, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. He says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the buildly, building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God, through the Spirit. And so, yes, it's true. Some people will say, well, I am a temple of God. My body is the temple of God. Or they'll say, well, I am a priest. We believe in the individual priesthood of the believer. But you know, no Christian is an island unto themselves. Some Christians have got the idea. I ran into a guy at a bookstore one time, and he was running around talking to people, and I was overhearing him talking. We were in the, Christ in the Christian book aisle, a very large bookstore. And he was going around telling people, well, I don't go to church. I don't believe in going to church because I am a priest. I believe in Jesus Christ, and I don't have to go to church. I am my own temple. And he was going around telling all these people this. Well, he was ignorant of the Word of God. It's that simple. The Bible's very clear. The Bible is very clear that our job, yes, we are temples, but we should be fitly joined together. And when we come together, our temple is really there to glorify God. We come together as a church, our temples, us, all of us come together, and we form a temple, a spiritual temple for God. I thank God that we do not need a building for us to come to in order for God to commune with us. You know, we could, we could meet out in the gymnasium out there, and I thank God that if we were to meet out in the gymnasium, say there was a fire in this place, and we had to meet out there, I thank God that God would come down and meet with us in that building because we have access to God through Jesus Christ, and He lives within us. We don't need a building in many ways like they did in the Old Testament. We don't need this building. We can meet out at the pavilion, and thank God, God will meet with us out at the pavilion. We can meet, uh, God forbid, the day comes when, when this building is taken away from us because uh, the forces of evil have come in and taken this liberty and this freedom from us. But you know what? We can still meet out in the woods, and it doesn't matter who comes. We're still going to praise God, and we're still going to preach the Word of God out in the woods. And God will still meet with us. Praise God for that. But if God has given us something like a church building and various facilities and properties and buses, and a parsonage, and the list goes on. You better know that God expects us to treat it with the best care, with the best of our ability, and with all of our might. If you want to write something down tonight, I'd write this down. Our church building is a direct reflection of our spiritual condition as a church body. Our church building is a direct reflection of our spiritual condition as a church body. In other words, if our church building has problems, our temple needs some work. This church, our church, any church of God should be sort of a miniature heaven. It should be a little heaven on earth. That's what it should be. It should be almost a direct reflection of heaven. How do we do that? Well, it's going to take lots of work. We're going to find that in our text. We're going to go through chapter 1 together. We'll exegete the scripture and go line by line. And I want to preach this message to you tonight. Go and build the house. Go and build the house. Please look with me at, at uh, chapter 1 and verse 8. It says, go. If you want to circle that, I would if I were you. Go up to the mountain and bring wood. And then if I were you, I would circle this. And build the house. And I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Let me read that one more time. Haggai chapter 1 verse 8. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. I love how the Bible is the best 
uh, commentary on itself. Because as soon as I noticed that this was chapter 1 and verse 8, the first verse I thought of was Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, which gives us the Great Commission to go. Right after the Lord Jesus Christ ascended up into heaven, it gives us the Great Commission. It tells us what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to go to our Jerusalem, our Judea, our Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth for the Lord Jesus Christ. And here we find in Haggai chapter 1, verse 8, a verse that tells them to go and build the house. You know, when we go out and we win people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, in a sense, we are building the house of God. We're building the kingdom of God because once they're saved, they're added to the kingdom of God. They're added to the church of God. And they should continue in baptism and they should continue in discipleship to the point of membership in a church where they are a productive member of the church. There are seven things I want us to see out of this passage, passage one. It won't take very long. But there are seven very, very, very important things for us to see in this passage of Scripture. Number one, where there is liberty, the house of God can be built. Let me say that again. Where there is liberty, the house of God can be built. Look at verse 1. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, high priest, saying. You say, well, what does that tell me? The first name there, in the second year of Darius the king. Darius the king, or King Darius, was a vital figure for the children of Israel to return back to their land and to rebuild the temple. Why? Because King Darius gave the Jews liberty to return back to their land. I'm sure he received some sort of unction from God, I don't know, but he gave them liberty to go back to their hometown and to rebuild the temple. I mean, it's a wonderful thing. All of a sudden, here we are. They have liberty. And, you know, I want you to think about where we're at today in America. We have this wonderful thing called what? Liberty. Liberty. Now, that's right. And, and, and because of that truth, since we know that, you know what, our liberties are growing dim. I mean, it seems like it's getting harder and harder to do the things that we always used to do, the freedoms that we've always had. It seems like they're starting to go down the toilet. Our moral uh, uh, mooring lines that used to help the, the hold this, this country at bay, it seems like they're starting to bust, and this, co- this country is about to just go adrift out to sea. And I, I see that just as much as you see that. But what ha- we ha- still have this wonderful thing called liberty. And what we should do is we should seize the opportunity to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ while we have it. No one can stop us from putting things out here on our church sign. They can't do it. First Amendment. That's a wonderful thing. No one can stop us from going door to door and knocking on doors and telling people about the love of Jesus Christ. No one can stop us. They're not allowed to. It's in the Constitution. They're not allowed to do that. Liberty. We have a wonderful liberty. And these people had liberty, and we're going to see how they handled it. We're going to see what they did. There may come a day when our facilities are taken from us. We have li- uh, but as for right now, we have liberty to preach the gospel. We have liberty to put what we want on that church sign out there, like I already said. We have liberty. Number two, an unbuilt temple is caused by, caused by apathetic people. Look with me at verse two. An unbuilt temple is caused by apathetic people. Verse two says, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Why is it that they've been given liberty to build the house of God, but it seems as though they believe that it's not the time to build the house of God? That's what they believe. And that's what the guy's saying. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say. Here's what they're saying. Here's what they're saying among, among each other. It's not time. It's not the season. This is not what we're supposed to be doing right now. We need to be doing something else. This is what they're saying. It's not time To build the house of the Lord. What you always find in a church that is not growing, that is dying and diminishing, is an apathetic people. You'll always find it. What is apathy? Apathy is a lack of interest, enthusiasm, or concern. It doesn't take very long to find out that people are apathetic to the things of God. It doesn't take very long to know who is apathetic and who can really care less about the things of God, especially concerning the church of God. It doesn't take long to look around and see the, the building and see uh, uh, the rooms that we have and to see the gymnasium and to see the, the, the facilities that we have and the parking lot and the property out there. It doesn't take long to figure out if the people are apathetic or if they have a love for God. 
They did not think it was time to build the house of God. They had the liberty to do so, but they had no concern for the house of God. You know, would to God we had some people concerned about the house of God. Would to God we had more concern about souls than politics. Would to God we had more who were more concerned about pulling people out of the fire than their Saturday morning or afternoon ball game. Would to God we had a church that simply cared. This is what Haggai the prophet is preaching. This is what he's preaching to those people. Number three, strong preaching is needed to reveal truth and correct apathy. Strong preaching is needed to reveal truth and correct apathy. As much as people don't want it, it's what God's method is. That's his method. The foolishness of preaching, that's what the Bible calls it. God's method is the preaching of God's word. That's how he does it. Verses 3 through 5. It says, Then came the word of the Lord, Amen, by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for ye, you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Ye have sown much, and bringeth, bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe ye, but there is no, none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. I've told you already that I've been up since 1.30 in the morning, so bear with me. But there's a reason for that. It's because God placed this message on my heart around that time. I mean, I already had the message in my mind. I knew where I wanted to go, but the Lord really stirred my heart for that around that time. And I couldn't get any sleep, and so I had to come over to my office right around 4 o'clock in the morning and start writing down what, what, what the Lord was placing on my heart. But one of the reasons why I couldn't sleep is because I knew that this was going to be a hard message. I don't, I don't take pleasure in preaching hard messages. I really don't. It's hard on a preacher to do that. Pastor knows. It's hard to do that. You never know how people are going to take it. But that's God's method. That's how God does it. Here's the truth. Most of us have spectacular homes. With the finest furnishings, top-of-the-line appliances, up-to-date technology. But when it comes to our church house, it's as if the church house gets the leftovers. The crumbs. The scraps, the junk. It's as if when someone wants to throw something away, they have guilt, so they conjure up the idea of donating it to the church. I'll always be the guy, and I know people don't like this, but I'll probably always be the guy that tells people, don't bring it here, uh, keep it at your house, or bring it somewhere else. And I realize, you know, some people will say, uh, uh, some people will say, one man's trash is another man's treasure. I've always said, one man's trash is usually another man's trash. And, uh, you may not agree with that, I understand that, uh, but I would be willing to, if I was a bet man, I'd probably put money on, on the fact that most of the stuff we, we sold at our garage sale, and hey, I praise God when we can generate some money and generate some income from the teens to go to camp, I understand that, okay? But I, I would be willing to bet that most of the stuff that was purchased is probably sitting in someone's garage somewhere, or sitting on someone's dining room table, or sitting in a closet somewhere. Why? Because we are a world full of stuff. We live in a world full of stuff. America is leading the world in storage, in storage spaces. It's a, it is a booming industry. I mean, if you want to make some good money, just go open, open up a storage unit. People will fill it with stuff that they'll never use. But one day, maybe they'll use it. That's what happens, right? I'm guilty of it. I'm guilty of it. But I've learned over the years to start throwing stuff away. Our church at one point had five vacuums. If you walk around, you'll find some good stuff. I'm telling you. You'll find some good stuff. It had five vacuums. We're down to three now, and there's one downstairs, there's one up here, and I think there's one over the gym now, but we're down, we're, we're down to three now. But you know, there's something about these vacuums. Every time I use them, I'm like, man, these things just are not good at all. They're terrible. I mean, it's as if someone at their house got a brand new vacuum, brought it to their house, and was like, well, what am I going to do with my old vacuum that still works? Well, I'll just bring it down to the church house. I'll drop it off and they can use it. Do we think that God is satisfied with our scraps? Does the church of God, does the house of God not deserve the very best? It should. The church is not a warehouse. It is the pillar on the ground of the truth and should be treated with that kind of reverence. And I'm not trying to be rude tonight, but if you get a chance, go out to the gymnasium. We've got to be very careful, okay, with the things that we collect, the things that we store. 
Because if it, be, if it starts impacting ministry endeavors, that's when we've got a problem. Okay? We've got to be able to have ministry out there in the gymnasium. I want to see kids running around that gymnasium, people sitting down with them and telling them about Jesus Christ, opening a Bible with them. But if there's stuff everywhere, and we have parents come by and see what their kids are involved with, and they see that, they see a dead mouse in the corner, that's not going to look very good, number one, on us, and number two, on the Lord Jesus Christ. So we've got to be careful with those things. Listen to this verse, Leviticus 19.30. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. That's a verse that I, I would love to adopt for this room right here. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Leviticus 19.30. I remember uh, I went to school over here. Temple Baptist Church uh, has a ministry, Crown College of the Bible. And uh, I'm sure by now thousands of people of men and women have graduated from that college and have gone off into the ministry. And uh, I remember one thing that, that stuck with me about their church. When they had built their new auditorium, their new sanctuary, the whole church got together and prayed that the Lord would bless all the services that were to come, that the Lord would bless all the efforts that went into all the services, that people would be saved. And there's one thing that they all agreed upon is concerning that sanctuary. They said, we will not make this place a place for activities. Some churches out there, they have all manner of different, I mean, carnivals in the auditorium. Uh, I mean, you name it, the list goes on. VBS, and I realize some people just don't have the facilities, and they'll utilize, utilize this. But I absolutely love that they did that. They were reverencing the Lord. Because this is a place for us to reverence the Lord. Not to bring in things from this world, not to bring in all the gimmicks of the world, but to reverence the Lord in the house of God. I tell my kids, and if you see them, please bear with me. If you see them running around here, jumping over seats, uh, running up and down the aisle, I give you permission to stop them in their tracks and take them to their seat, give them a whooping if you have to, and let them know, no, let me know, and uh, let them know that they need to sit still and sit down. Because this is the sanctuary, and I want that to be passed on to them. And I want them to pass that on to their children. Because if you don't do those things eventually, over time, it all goes downhill. It all goes down the tube. So go study. I want you to, uh, if you have the time, I'd implore you to go study the temple, the tabernacles, the tents, the Ark of the Covenant, all of those Old Testament dwelling places for God, and you'll find that they're made with the finest materials. They're made with gold, precious metals. They're not made with, with uh, things that are broken down vacuum. Okay, And so, n number four, neglecting the house of God produces no satisfaction in life. Neglecting the house of God produces no satisfaction in life. I've already read the verse, we'll read it again. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Neglecting the house of God produces no satisfaction in life. If you neglect the church of God, you will never find fulfillment in your life. And you can pretty much mark that down. I've always said the hardest life to live is a life lived outside the will of God. It's not to be a, a hell-bound sinner. Not, yes, they live hard lives, and, and they live lives that are just leading to destruction, and they don't have uh, a, a, any good place to go. Their, their, their end is destruction, the Bible tells us. Uh, but can I tell you something? Something that's a lot harder than that is to be a child of God, to know right and wrong, to know in many ways the Holy Bible, to have the Holy Ghost living within you, and to be in opposition to God. It's the worst life, life to live. I've seen people go downhill. You know, they get out of church, and then they stop coming more. And then before you know it, they've got a job, or before you know it, they've got something else, and they're just not in church at all anymore. And, and, and you see it on Facebook, you see it on social media, and then they're right back into the world. They're complaining about their problems, they're complaining about all this. When, if they were in the house of God, they could have been comforted, they could have been helped in those difficult times. Neglecting the house of God produces no satisfaction in life. You can go on any vacation you want, and uh, you can go on vacation for a lifetime. I mean, you name it. You could go to Haiti or Haiti or whatever it is. You could go to Hawaii. One time, my wife and I, we had the, the, the privilege to go to Hawaii, which was great while I was in the Navy. It was wonderful. Can I tell you something? You could be on vacation every day for the rest of your life, and it wouldn't replace how great it is to be in the house of God. It just wouldn't replace it. 
you'll never find that kind of satisfaction. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but listen to this part, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. That word exhorting means to be called to law on one side. If you're on the live stream, can I tell you something? That's not exhorting one another. You, can't, you may get a little bit of exhortation from a live stream service to sit there and watch that, and I praise God for those things because there are people out there who don't get, without the live stream, they wouldn't get the opportunity to watch these messages. But can I tell you something? A live stream service should never replace an in-person service, period. If you're thinking, man, I don't know if I want to go to church there or if I want to watch a live stream, can I tell you what you need to do? Go to church. Just establish that principle in your life. That's what you need to do. Exhorting one another, called to one side. We talked about not being an island to yourself. Your temple is in ruins if you believe you can survive without church. The hardest life to live, as I've already said, is a life lived outside the will of God. Number five, a ruined house is a house that lacks the hand of God. A ruined house is a house that lacks the hand of God. Look at verses 9 through 11. It says, You looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, it did blow, I did blow upon it. God speaking. I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and you run every man unto his own house. Everyone's more interested in their own house than they are the house of God. That's what's happening here. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands. What causes God to withhold His hand of blessings upon a people? Well, number one, apathy. Number two, a lack of strong preaching. We've gone through some of these things. Number three, uh, they're more interested in their own house, in their own homes, than they are the house of God. I mean, that is direct from the text right there. You run every man to his own house. It sounds a lot like America. The, 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 the American dream is for everyone to live on a thousand acres, right? Everyone's got to have a, a big house and a big shop in the backyard. That's kind of my thing. I'd love to have a shop. I would love to have a two-car garage. Boy, I tell you what, I could do a lot in a two-car garage. I would love to have a two-car garage. I just picked up a boat out here for very, very cheap. It was like a gold mine. I couldn't believe I found it. I have nowhere to put the thing, <laughs> but I wanted the boat. And so, uh, and so what is the American dream? It's, it's to have this wonderful house, this wonderful house, but what do we do when it comes to the church of God? We just kind of tip our hat off. Oh, yeah, I go to church on Sunday morning and Sunday evening, and that's about enough. I thank God for the people that are here tonight. Uh, these are usually, the, the Sunday night crowd usually represents the faithful of the church, the, the, the percentage of people who have stayed strong in the faith, who are, who are steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. So thank you for being here. I'm kind of preaching to the choir tonight. But you know what I'm saying. In America, people are more interested in their homes. Their homes are far more immaculate than the house of God. Of people who are sold out to God, do you know what separates a thriving church from a dying church? I think I told you this already, of people who are sold out to God. If you care more about your own house than you do the house of God, it's quite simple. You are not sold out to God. And I'll add to that, you know, there are many churches out there, and, and this is how I know that there are no excuses. There are many churches out there that are thriving churches. Young people busting at the seams. Uh, they've got building programs, programs to extend their buildings to add more seats. Sadly, there are a lot of churches out there that have construction pro projects to downsize. I don't think that's good. That's just me. The Bible says he wants his house to be full. It's very clear. And God is about building his church, not downsizing i understand there are some towns and cities out there they have no other choice i mean the city's going down and so as the city goes down the population decreases a lot of times the churches do that too that happens can i tell you something we live in murfreesboro murfreesboro is busting at the seams when it comes to people i am absolutely shocked shocked at how many people are at that college that brother michael's at and how many people by the way are willing to sit there and listen to you Give them the gospel. I mean, it is wide open. Wide open. It's easy. It's easy as butter. Easy as pie, whatever they say. It's really easy to, to share the gospel. Easy as butter. I think that's one of them. That, isn't there one like that, easy as butter? No? Okay. A, a person who is sold out to God, a person who is sold out to God is one who is soul-sensitive. 
I'll say this until you put me in the grave or I go by way of rapture or one or the other. A church will either evangelize or they'll fossilize. A church will either evangelize or they will fossilize. Evangelism is very important. There are a lot of churches who have neglected and who have forsaken soul winning. That's the worst thing a church can do. I'm just letting you know that right now. It, you actually cease from being a church if you stop evangelizing. You just cease from being a church because that's our whole point for being here. Uh, number one, so that we can s- assemble together and, and help each other and exhort one another and grow. And, and it's the pastor's job to feed the flock as he does. But it's the church's job as a whole to evangelize the world about us, to be a light in this community, to Murfreesboro, this busting uh, 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 community that we have. 700 people a week, I think it is, moving into Murfreesboro. A person who is sold out to God is one who hates the world. Hates the world, Brother Michael. It seems like every time we have a, a discipleship together, he always tells me, I just hate this world. And I'm like, yeah, me too, man. I hate this world too. And that's good. That's a good sign. You don't find very many Christians like that anymore. A Christian that will come to you and say, I hate this world. I just can't stand it. I, can't, I hate this world. And we don't, wanna, we don't want the world to drive us to depression. I told you that, right? But we should hate the world. And we should want to turn from the world and turn towards God and, and continue. Here's another a person who sold out to God is actively working on sanctification and separation. Actively working on that in their life. They're faithful to church spiritually and physically. They're, they're, they're faithful with their finances. The giving to the church. Right? We know that. When you neglect the house of God, God withholds his blessings from your life. What is it that will allow God to shower heaven's blessing upon FHIBC? Well, let's look at point number six. A house can be built by obedience to the preacher of the word. When pastor stands up here and preach, you know what we need? Obedience. I mean, it really is that simple. When he stands up here and preaches, we need from the people obedience. I want to show you this in verses 12 through 15. Look with me, look with me there. Then Zerubbabel, the son of uh, Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people did fear before the Lord. So what did they do? They obeyed the preaching of God's word. The word was already there. I mean, they knew the word. They had much of their Old Testament already. They knew what they were supposed to do, but they needed someone to come in and fire them up and get them ready and get them excited about rebuilding the temple of God. To turn away from their own personal lives, hey, to deny themselves, to deny themselves, to die to self, to say, hey, I realize I've got this old broken down vacuum. I just bought a brand new one. Maybe I could buy a brand new one for the church rather than giving them a used one. I'm talking about denying yourself and giving yourself wholly to the work of God. That's what was required. You know, there weren't very many people who returned to Jerusalem, and they had a big task at hand to rebuild the temple. Do you think they were all masonries? No. Do you think they all knew how to build a foundation? No. Do you think they all had the skills and the tools and the, and the wherewithal? No. It's not always about that. Sometimes you've just got to be available. Sometimes you've just got to be there. Sometimes you've just got to be all in and say, you know what? Whatever comes, I am just going to do what God tells me to do. I I realize not everyone is a a people person. Not everyone has the ability to lead people to Christ very well. Not everyone's fully gifted at that, but we can all be there. We can all be there to just hand out a gospel tract. We can all be there to tell someone about Jesus Christ. Sometimes it's just about being faithful. Do not simply obey any preacher. This is very clear in this passage. Obey a preacher of the word of God. There are many men and sadly women out there who call themselves preachers. I would not obey 90% of of the people in this world who call themselves preachers. And so what's the difference? How do you know if you should obey a preacher and not obey a preacher? Well, I'll tell you. Here are some things. To be a preacher of the word of God, they must be, number one, a man. Yes. A man. First Timothy 2.12 says, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Women don't like that one. I already know that. I mean, it's, it's no secret. Women hate that. It's all over the Internet. Go research that on the Internet, and you'll find 800 million female preachers and pastors, they call themselves, who attack this verse with everything in their heart and mind. Do not simply obey any preacher. Make sure they are a man. And by the way, it's kind of hard for a woman to be the husband of one wife. 
The Bible is very clear on the qualifications of a pastor. Be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. 2 Timothy 4.2. COVID should have no effect on a preacher. In fact, COVID, COVID or illness or a, or, a, or a national crisis, anything like that should have no effect on a preacher. They're supposed to be instant, in season, out of season, to reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. I thank God I was so happy when I heard a preacher tell me that they didn't close down their doors. There may have been a couple days, I realize that, but for the most part, they didn't close down their doors through COVID. That's how it should be. That's how it should be. You want to know why? Because it's in times like that when we really need the Word of God, even more than we're in living in times of prosperity. We need the Word of God, and that's why God designed it that way. Times of prosperity or in times of depression, a preacher must preach. They're to reprove, which means to expose sin. They're to rebuke, which means to warn of pitfalls and judgment of sin. They're to exhort, comfort, or draw near. One third of those is positive. The other two are negative. That's why people don't like preachers. <laughs> They're also to preach all the counsel of God, Acts twenty twenty seven. They should preach the whole counsel of God. Some preachers out there will say, well, you know what? I'll preach this one truth, but I'm going to avoid preaching about sin I'm going to avoid preaching about hell. I'm going to avoid preaching about righteous living and holiness. But that's not preaching the whole counsel of God. And so they must preach the whole counsel of God. Number seven, bear with me here. Building the house of God demands hard work by all members. That's right. A, L, L. All. That's what the Bible says. By the way, the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. For instruction, correction, for for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And so, all Scripture, even that word "all" right there, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for us. In other words, there's something we could take that as doctrine, as truth. Now, listen. Building the house of God demands hard work by all members. Look with me at verse eight. He said, go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Now look with me at verse 14. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord, of hosts, their God. And if you notice, it said, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. The spirit of all the remnant of the people. Modern Baptists are scared of this word work. They, will, they shun the idea of preaching on work, work, work for the night is coming, work for the Lord Jesus Christ, do a work. They do that, and they don't understand that they're missing like three-quarters of the Bible because the Bible is very clear that we need to work, and we need to work hard for the Lord. Rightfully so, because we are so adamant against a work salvation, and I understand that. But the problem is not work. It place, it's placing work in the wrong position. It's getting the cart before the horse. If you place work in front of your salvation, you're, you're wrong. Because you don't work for your salvation. If you place work after your salvation, you are very right. And that's very biblical. Okay? Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace you save through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But no one ever mentions verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works which God hath before saying that we should walk in them. God knows the, work of F, the works of FHIBC. If you were to study the seven churches of Asia Minor in the book of Revelation, you will find that God says, I know thy works to all seven churches. Do you think God knows the works of FHIBC? Do you think God knows whether we're giving him our scraps or our, or, 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 our trash or, or if we're just kind of tipping our hat off to him? He knows. Do you think that that could be why God is withholding his blessings from FHIBC? Could be. Very much could be. God knows our works. And God very much expects us to be working for him. We've all heard it. Work for the night is coming. Good song. God knows the works of FHIBC. People will work their life to death down at the job, but when it comes to the work of God, they are nowhere to be found. Labor not, labor not to be rich, the Bible says. Cease from thine own wisdom. Some people will work their life to death trying to uh, earn money, trying to make money, trying to make an income, trying to build up their savings plan, trying to build up their 401k. The Bible is very clear. Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, my life verse. I'm almost done here. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You know what that means? 
That, that verse has helped me more than you could ever imagine. When COVID hit, my ministry ceased to exist. We, we, uh, we, we were in the nursing home at the time, nursing home ministry. And for nursing homes, when COVID came around, they closed the doors. They didn't just close the doors. They closed the windows. I mean, they closed everything. They, they shut that place down. It didn't matter if you were a preacher of God's word. It didn't matter who you were. You were not getting inside that facility. And my ministry came to an end. And one day as I was reading my Bible, I thought about my, my life verse. And I came to that part, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And I asked myself, here I am. The government has told me I need to stay inside my house all day long. And my Bible tells me to always abound in the work of the Lord. How am I abounding in the work of the Lord sitting on my couch watching television all day long? It wasn't happening. It simply wasn't happening. And so Meg and I said, we've got to do something. I need to do something for the Lord. We've been there. We, were in the, we were in our little apartment over there in Knoxville for like maybe three days. This was whenever it really hit hard. And they closed down everything. Everyone had to stay inside. I don't know if you guys remember that or not. But we decided to do a care package for our neighbors. And so we left a little care package to our neighbors who were from um, India. And, uh, and so we decided that it didn't matter what we were going through. We were still going to abound in the work of the world. We were going to do our best to try and minister to someone's life in this very difficult hour that we're living in. 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty eight. One day... I was in my backyard pulling rocks from a very large rock garden. And, uh, boy, I was working very hard. It took me two days to get all these rocks out. And uh, it was a mess. It was just a complete mess. I, I had put the rocks in thinking, oh, this will look great. But I'm not a landscaper, okay? And the next year came about, and there were weeds everywhere. And so I had to go back there and pull all the rocks up. It was terrible. It took me a whole day. I was sweating. I was covered in dirt and mud. I had to go buy a wheelbarrow. I mean, I worked myself to death trying to get these rocks up, trying to get the landscape tarp up, trying to get everything up. The next day, I came back in with a pallet of sod. And then I started taking that sod and I started planting it in all the little spots, putting the sod down the way I'm supposed to. I researched it and all that. I put it down and, boy, I had all of these scratches up and down my arm. From, from the tip of my fingers all the way up to my shoulders. See, I wasn't smart enough to wear long sleeve shirts. I was just out there in who knows what, a regular shirt, moving sod around. I was covered in dirt from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. And I was so discouraged at that time. I was defeated. I thought, what did I get myself into? I've got all of this rest of the yard to do. And I was just defeated. And I, I just went down and I, and I said, God, you're going to have to help me with this. I need some strength. And God told me something in my heart. He spoke to me. He said, if you're willing to work this hard to make to put some grass in your backyard, are you not willing to do some of that to win souls to Jesus Christ and to go out door knocking and to be in church faithfully and to, to go do the things you're supposed to do? And I remember looking down at my arms and seeing all the cuts and all the scrapes, and I thought about Jesus Christ. I thought, man, what he had to go through for me to save me. Am I not willing to go out and work hard? I mean work hard. I mean sweat a little bit. I mean, uh, the, the things that you do down at the workplace. I mean, we put countless hours into making money. And we tip our hat off to God when it comes to church service. Could it be that God's trying to get a hold of us and say, hey, get back to building the house of God like the former days, like it once was? I, I listen to pastor and he tells me stories, stories and stories and stories about how the church in its, in its former days, kind of like what we read there, in its first days uh, in, in chapter 2, and all the wonderful things that they did. And there's one thing I always remember that you say, is that the one thing they were doing is they were all out, outreaching. They were all out, knocking on doors. They were all out there doing things that they're supposed to do. I realize it's not always going to be knocking on doors. I realize that. I understand that. I understand that we have a lot of older folks in our church. But this is who we have. This is our remnant. Just like them. This is our remnant. And by the way, the ones who knew the former days, the ones who knew the temple and its glory, were the older ones. And it took them. It took them to stand up and say, we're going to have to do something for God, or this temple's never going to get built. This church needs a lot of work. 
It's a sad thing when, when there's, when there's uh, tiles that are falling from the ceiling and there's water stains on the ceiling and, and there's, there's dead mice in the corner. I realize we're working on getting those taken care of. When there's uh, old materials that go to VBSs all the way back to 2012 and 2013 and 2014 and I look at all this stuff and I'm thinking, man, they must have been doing a lot of stuff back in the day. I mean, they've got banners, they've got all kinds of equipment. They've got all kinds of stickers and, and crafts and uh, gear. and I mean, you name it. You can find bin after bin after bin of stuff that used to be ministry stuff. But why aren't we doing those things anymore? We need to get back to the former days. We need to get back to doing the things and working hard for the Lord. That's the only way it's going to happen. People will go to ball games in the rain and the snow. But when it comes to soul winning, when it comes to being faithful to the house of God, they're nowhere to be found. This is the last thing I have for you, and then we'll go home tonight. Matthew chapter 9, verses 36 through 38. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth labors into his harvest. Sometimes as I walk these halls in this church, or the gymnasium, or while I'm out on the bus route, or out soul winning, I, t- I think of this verse. And almost see myself standing in the place of our Lord Jesus Christ as he looks out and sees the great potential. He sees the multitude. And uh, he thinks to himself, how many souls there are that can be reached. The harvest is plenteous is what he's saying to 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 his disciples about concerning this multitude. And with great compassion on those who are without a shepherd, he simply realizes that there are not enough laborers to do what needs to be done. Friend, that verse is still true for you and I today. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Someone in this church was praying for laborers. I believe that. When I got here, there were three other boys that showed up too. And then another guy showed up. And then another young man showed up. And now we've got another man, young man, that's kind of coming every now and then. I mean, God is, that's not a coincidence. If you think that's a coincidence, you're wrong. There's no coincidence about that. God is trying to get a hold of us. Let's not ruin it. If you're, if you're criticizing those who God has brought in, shame on you. Because they're out working hard. We've got some people that are discouraged right now. I know that for a fact. People that want to quit, and that's not right. They shouldn't quit on God. No one should ever quit on God. They need your prayers. They need your support. They need your help. However that may be. The harvest truly is plenty, but believers are few. Encourage them and be a help to them as much as you can. Lastly, get involved in the building of your church house. Let's stand tonight. And as the piano plays here in just a minute, you can come forward. I want you to ask yourself just this one simple question. I mean, consider, consider the uh, children of Israel as they were given liberty to go back to the house, to build the house of God. And I want you to consider this church building. I want you to maybe consider your spiritual life. Maybe your temple has some, some problems with it, some cracks in the foundation, some, some mortar problems, some brick problems. Maybe you've got to build yourself up spiritually so that you could be a better help to the church. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe you're just not here. Maybe you know that you can help out. Maybe you know the church in its former days and you're thinking, man, I need to do more. We had a few people show up yesterday. I'm thankful for those. I really am because I needed it. <laughs> I needed some help. I've got a list, two pages long, of things that need to be done. I went through and I X'd off of the things that I think we accomplished. I did a percentage count on it. 20, I think it was 26% of the things that we need to get done were accomplished yesterday. I praise God for that. I tell you something, that would be a failing grade in, in school. 26%. We can do more. We can do more. I mean, anyone can clean a baseboard. Anyone can wipe down some spider webs. Anyone can vacuum a carpet. Anyone can clean a baptistry. Anyone can help out in the nursery. There's so many things that need to be done. Everyone, anyone can watch some kids. Thankful for the nursery workers. Very challenging ministry. Maybe there's some way you can ha- help out. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you'd like to come forward, if you'd like to ask the Lord to help you, give you strength, to be a help to your church, if you've maybe seen the church in its glory days and you want the church to go back to that, why don't you pray and ask God? Why don't you pray and ask God to help 
this church get back to winning souls to Jesus Christ. I thank God that this church still stands on the truth of God's word. Still preaching the gospel. But we need more laborers. We need more laborers. There's no doubt about it. 